This is the obituary of Ida B. Wells, published in the New York Times. It was not all that unusual when in 1892, a mob dragged Thomas Moss out of a Memphis jail in his pajamas and shot him to death over a feud that began with the game of marbles. But as lynching changed history because of its effect on one of the nation's most influential journalists, who was also the godmother of his first child, Ida B. Wells. Wells is considered by historians to have been the most famous black woman in the United States during her lifetime, even as she was dogged by prejudice, a disease infecting Americans from coast to coast. She pioneered reporting techniques that remained central tenets of modern journalism. And as a former slave who stood less than five feet tall, she took on structural racism more than half a century before her strategies were repurposed, often without crediting her during the 1960s civil rights movement. Wells was already a 30-year-old newspaper editor living in Memphis when she began her anti-lynching campaign, the work for which she is most famous. After Moss was killed, she set out on a reporting mission, crisscrossing the South over several months as she conducted eyewitness interviews and dug up records on dozens of similar cases. Her goal was to question a stereotype that was often used to justify lynchings, that black men were rapists. Instead, she found that in two thirds of mob murders, uh, rape was never an accusation. And she often found evidence of what had actually been a consensual interracial relationship. She published her findings in a series of fiery editorials in the newspaper. She co-owned and edited the Memphis Free Speech in Headlight. The public, it turned out, was starved for her stories and devoured them voraciously. The journalist, a mainstream trade publication that covered the media, named her the princess of the press. Readers of her work were drawn in by her fine-tooth reporting methods and language that even by today's standard was apparently bold. There has been no word equal to it in convincing power. Frederick Douglass wrote to her in a letter that hatched their friendship. I have spoken, but my word is feeble in comparison. That's Frederick Douglass. He was referring to writing like the kind that she published in the free speech in May 1892. Wells wrote, nobody in this section of the country believes the threadbare old lie that Negro men rape white women. Instead, Wells saw lynching as a violent form of subjugation, an excuse to get rid of Negroes who were acquiring wealth and property and thus keep the race terrorized and the nigger down, she wrote in her journal. Wells was born into slavery in Holly Springs, Mississippi in 1862, less than a year before emancipation. She grew up during Reconstruction, Reconstruction that is, the period when black men, including her father, were able to vote, ushering black representatives into state legislatures across the South. One of eight siblings, she often tagged along to Bible school on her mother's hip. In 1878, her parents both died of yellow fever, along with one of her brothers, and at 16, she took on caring for the rest of her siblings. She supported them by working as a teacher after dropping out of high school and lying about her age. She finished her own education at night and on the weekends. Around the same time, the Civil Rights Act of 1875 was largely nullified by the Supreme Court, reversing many of the advancements of Reconstruction. The anti-black sentiment that grew around her was ultimately codified in Jim Crow. It felt like a dramatic whiplash, said Troy Duster, Wells' grandson, who is a sociology professor at the University of California, Berkeley, and New York University. She cuts her teeth politically in this time of justice, 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 and then injustice. Observing the changes around her, Wells decided to become a journalist during what was a golden era for black writers and editors. Her goal was to write about black people for black people, about black people for black people, in a way that was accessible to those who, like her, were born the property of white owners and had much to defend. Her articles were often reprinted abroad as well as in more than 200 black weeklies then in circulation in the United States. Whenever possible, Wells named the victims of racist violence and told their stories. In her journal, she lamented that her subjects would have otherwise been forgotten by all save the night wind, no memorial service to bemoan their sad and horrible fate. 
Wells also organized economic boycotts long before the tactic was popularized by other mostly male civil rights activists who are often credited with its success. In 1883, she was forced off a train car reserved for white women. She sued the railroad and lost on appeal before the Tennessee Supreme Court, after which she urged African Americans to avoid the trains and later to leave the South entirely. That sound familiar? Mm -hmm. I'm editorializing it, back to the script, okay. She also traveled to Britain to rally her cause, encouraging the British to stop purchasing American cotton and angering many white Southern business owners. Wells was fierce in conversation, was as fierce in conversation as she was in her writing, which made it difficult for her to maintain close relationships, according to her family. She criticized people, including friends and allies whom she saw as weak in their commitment to the cause that she cared about. She didn't suffer fools, and she saw fools everywhere. <laughs> That's her grandson saying that. <laughs> One exception was her husband and closest confidant, Ferdinand L. Barnett, a widower who was a lawyer and a civil rights activist here in Chicago. After they married in 1895, Barrett's activism took a back seat to his wife's career. Theirs was an atypically modern relationship. He cooked dinner for the children most nights, and he cared for them while she traveled to make speeches and organize. Later in life, Wells fell from prominence, prominence as she was replaced by activists like Booker T. Washington and W.E.B. Du Bois, who were more conservative in their tactics and thus had more support from the white and black establishments. Ta -ta -ta. She, uh, <laughs> She helped to found prominent civil rights organizations, including the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, the NAACP, and the National Association of Colored Women, only to be edged out of their leadership. During the final years of her life, living in Chicago, Wells ran for the Illinois State Senate, but lost abysmally. Despite her ebbing influence, she continued to organize around causes such as mass incarceration, working for several years as a probation officer until she died of kidney disease in March 25th, on March 25th, 1931, at the age of 68. Wells was threatened physically and rhetorically constantly throughout her career. She was called a harlot, a courtesan. Did I even say that right? I should have read that word before I got up. Somebody said, who, I should, I'm supposed to be a journalist, right? A courtesan? Thank you, mama, a courtesan. I appreciate Sylvia Ewan, thank you. <laughs> For her frankness about uh, interracial sex. Uh, after her anti-lynching editorials were published in the free speech, she was run out of the South. Her newspaper ransacked and her life threatened. But her commitment to chronicling the experience of African Americans in order to demonstrate their humanity remained unflinching. And this is a quote directly from Ida B. Wells. She says, if this work can contribute in any way toward proving this, and at the same time arouse the conscience of the American people to demand justice to every citizen and punishment by law for the lawless, I shall feel I have done my race a service. She wrote that after fleeing Memphis. Other considerations are minor. Let's put our hands together for the legacy of Mrs. Ida B. Wells. That piece, that article is by Caitlin Dickerson, Ida B. Wells, who took on racism in the Deep House with powerful reporting on lynchings. It was published March 8th of this year after the New York Times went back and looked at all of the women and people of color and marginalized people in this country who were not properly memorialized. And they went back and wrote these obituaries. And what better way to begin our panel in this evening uh, with a round of applause Please welcome our panelists. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for being here. Um, it's just a great honor to be on stage with all these dynamos. Um, so we're gonna talk for about 30 minutes and then we're gonna turn it over to Q&A. 
Um, I used to live in Bronzeville, walking distance from here, and when I was looking for my condo, I was like, okay, this is right around the corner from Robert Abbott's house, and I'm in the same neighborhood as Ida B. Wells. Like, that really meant something to me to come back to this, this neighborhood. I don't know when I first learned about her. I just think she was in my psyche being from here and then wanting to be a journalist. Um, Eve, what... What's your first memory of Ida B. Wells? You know, I think I'm like you. I don't ever remember learning about her. I feel like she's one of those people that was always in my consciousness. But I think it's special when, uh, as adults, we get to, I think it's important for us to visit and revisit the histories that we've taken for granted and the people that we thought that we knew. So I've been really enjoying, um, in the last several years, kind of revisiting my own relationship to Ida B. Wells and understanding her in a black feminist tradition, in a Chicago tradition. Um, so I feel like I'm always learning more about her. Uh, what would you say your relationship to her is now? You know, um, so if you've heard me talk this year, you know that I'm thinking a lot about ghosts and all the different places that ghosts reside. So um, Ida B. Wells uh, lived on 36th and King Drive from 1919 until 1929. And she passed in 1931. Um, and so as I've been, as I was writing Ghosts in the Schoolyard and um, thinking about Bronzeville a lot, I feel like I've been grateful for her spirit and the way that it inhabits uh, the work that we do now. Nicole? I think about this a lot, and I also cannot remember exactly. I, I have this image of sometime in elementary school, it was during Black History Month, and they put up like five black people uh, and she was one of them. <laughs> and it was like, a, like one of those cameo-shaped, like oval-shaped photos that was on the wall. And I don't even remember how they described her. I don't know if they described her as a journalist or a civil rights activist. I just remember her name. But, so I knew her name, but I didn't really know exactly what she did, which tells you how good we learned about black history. Um, and then I was in college. And I would just go to the college bookstore and just look at books that other professors whom I wasn't taking, I was nerdy, uh, were teaching. And I came across her memoir. And I hadn't read really any memoirs written by black women of that era. Um, and I was thinking about being a journalist, so I got the memoir. And then when I read it, I was like, holy shit, like, I didn't know that black women acted like that back then. Um, <laughs> You know, to, to think of someone who's born into slavery, who is uh, living in a time where women didn't have the right to vote, black people had gotten the right to vote but were struggling to actually use that right to vote, um, that she hyphenated her name, that she turned down all her suitors, that she marries a feminist, that she's a suffragist, that she's a civil rights activist, that she's like an investigative reporter who has the courage to like go into places where they have literally just strung black people up and killed them and ask questions. I, I mean, you just, I don't know women who would do that now necessarily. So I think it was just something about that where um, she just, all, she stuck with me ever since then because any, there weren't a lot of templates uh, for what I wanted to do. I didn't grow up seeing any ideas or any uh, examples of black women investigative reporters. And sadly, I kind of had to go back to the 1800s to even have that. But if you had to go back in time, she was the most amazing one. I've also heard you refer to her as your spiritual grandmother. I do. <laughs> I finally got the blessing of the family, so now I don't have to feel. <laughs> your family now. <laughs> At first, I was I like, somebody, gonna, somebody's going to bust me out and be like, stop claiming my grandmother. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I, I really do, you know, when, when, when her great-grandson said that she didn't suffer fools, I was like, yeah, that sounds like myself. Uh, so, I, yeah, I, I think about her a lot, and I really do think she guides my work because she had such a strong sense of what was right and what was wrong. And what I also loved about her, she refused, you know, she refused to be bougie, right? She, she, she was not going to separate herself from the less educated and the poor amongst her people in a way that a lot of folks, when they get some prominence, they do. And I think that's always been the model. Um, so clearly, that's why my Twitter name is Ida Bay Wells, in honor of her. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I commissioned a portrait of my daughter with Ida B. Wells in the background. Like, I'm 
kind of obsessed You're all in. with her. I really all in. She was on my birthday cake two years ago. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, she's, she was just amazing. And, and I think it's been so fulfilling to see her getting some do finally. Um, that people know who she is. I mean, still on Twitter, some people think my name is Ida, which I just find to be very annoying. Um, <laughs> because I'm like, you still don't know who she is at this point, but I think it's been really gratifying to see that. Michelle, you grew up knowing about your, gra your great-grandmother, but not being lectured about her. You come from a, a big family, um, and four generations have tried to honor and protect and amplify who she is. Can you talk about some of those efforts um, in regards to maintaining her legacy? Right. Um, well, it has been, maintaining uh, my great-grandmother's legacy has been a family effort, and it was a family effort, it seemed like, for a very long time. Um, after, I mean, my, gra my great-grandmother died in 1931, and it was the Depression. And my grandmother, her daughter, was her youngest uh, child out of four children. And my grandmother had five children in the middle of the Depression, and she actually became a widow. So she, it was not easy for her to raise her family and also try to make sure that her mother's legacy was known. I mean, that's just anybody who's a parent, I'm sure you can imagine that's not easy. And so, but my, my grandmother is the one out of the four children, I guess, who took the interest in trying to do what she could um, to make sure that her mother was remembered. And so my dad told me when he was growing up, he remembered his mother, who's my grandmother, working in the margins of her life in, the, in between raising five children to um, edit the manuscript of her mother's autobiography. And it finally was published in 1970 um, by the University of Chicago, so almost 40 years wow. from the time her mother died until the uh, autobiography was published. So that's dedication for you <laughs> uh, when it comes to making sure that your family is remembered, your family member is remembered. And then after the, um, after the book was published, my grandmother did a lot of, participated in a lot of um, auto, of, um, what do you call them? <laughs> um, interviews where, you, where, where oral history, that's what I'm thinking of, oral history projects so that it could be documented also at the Schlesinger Library in, at Radcliffe, um, their tapes, and then also, um, I found one online with Studs Terkel, did an interview of my grandmother, and she also did some speaking, but she was an older woman at that point. My father's generation took up the mantle after my grandmother died in 1930, I mean, 1983. Um, my parents' generation in 1988 established the Ida B. Wells Memorial Foundation, and they started off with uh, offering journalism um, awards, and then we eventually segued into giving awards to college students to help the next generation get their education at Ida's alma mater, Russ College in Holly Springs, Mississippi. They also, my father's generation, uh, were very big supporters of Paula Giddings, writing her seminal uh, biography, only 800 pages, <laughs> um, of Ida's story. And they also were very involved with the documentary film that was PBS film on the American Experience series. My generation has continued the foundation. I, as a writer, um, edited two books with my great-grandmother's original writings because I wanted to take her wor work out of the archives and make it available for everybody. Um, and what else? Oh, my God. Um, we've done a lot. Oh, there's a, there's a museum, uh, Ida B. Wells Barnett Museum in Holly Springs, Mississippi, which is the house that Ida was born on that property. So if any of you ever are in Memphis, it's only about a 30 minute drive south of Memphis to get to Holly Springs. And we, um, we support that museum. And then the next generation after me, one of my cousins wrote a play about Ida's experience with the railroad. So that's four generations after my great grandmother that are just continuing. And I think what, what our approach is, is not about 
look at us, our family so great, and my great, and our, and Ida was um, just this one person that needs to be memorialized. This is about black history, it's about American history, and we can't let other people erase us. Mm -hmm. And so that's what our family's about. You've also told me that there was a period where you struggled about your own identity um, and people making assumptions about who you are because this was your great-grandmother. Can you share a little bit about that journey? Well, there have been times when uh, people want to know about my great-grandmother and they want to talk to me about my great-grandmother. and they want to talk to me about my great-grandmother, and they want to talk to me about my great-grandmother. <laughs> and I'm like, hello, I'm here. <laughs> like, I, I'm Michelle, you know, so there, that's been a little bit of a struggle for me, for people to see me, mm. Michelle, not me, a vessel that, that, that's connected to the person they really want to know about. Um, so, and that, and that is it's a continuing struggle, and... Um, it's an honor for me to be related to her, and I'm very happy that people are interested in her, and they, you know, they're, they're thirsty for knowledge. Um, but, but I'm sure most people who are related to somebody who's famous, it, it is a little bit of a um, attention of wanting people to remember who your ancestor was, but also being seen as a separate individual person. Um, a couple of years ago when people were voting in the presidential election, uh, a lot of women were making pilgrimages, a pilgrimage to Susan B. Anthony's grave. And I had a friend here email me and say, will you go with me to visit Ida B. Wells' grave right in um, Oakwood Cemetery? So we laid flowers and you know had, had a moment. Um, we heard the, the obit and we've, I mean, there's so many threads of her life to talk about, but let's talk about her as this black feminist icon. Can I, <laughs> you know what, I can't believe, this is um, just going back to the two questions ago, I can't believe that I forgot about the monument. <laughs> oh, we're gonna talk about that. Yeah. We're gonna talk about it, I'm saving oh, okay. that, yeah. Okay, yeah. Great. Well, I'll pick up that thread, I mean, you know, um, it is still a struggle for black women in 2018 in the 21st century to be recalled, remembered, and visible at the intersection of our identities, right? And um, there are still so many moments where black women are excluded or marginalized from conversations about racial justice and excluded or marginalized from conversations about gender-based justice. And it's so inspiring, but also um, instructive and frustrating to think about the legacy of Ida B. Wells and the ways in which she was um, marginalized and pushed aside by some people who we consider American heroes, um, people like Susan B. Anthony, people like W.E.B. Du Bois, who was, who was my you know, spiritual grandfather. Um, and it's frustrating to think about the fact that one of the reasons why this moment of her legacy bubbling back up has to happen is because she was actually intentionally erased from the narrative because by virtue of being a black woman mm -hmm. who insisted on the fullness of both of those identities. And for those of you who don't know, uh, you know, a lot of the, what we think about the, the heroes of the women's suffrage movement, um, many of those white women explicitly did not want black women to be part of the conversation because they were afraid that if we bring up this race stuff, right, it's gonna complicate things and you all just need to wait till later, let us get the vote first, right? And that echoes so many conversations we hear today, um, both from black men and white women around the conversations of just wait, we'll deal with y'all later, right? Without the understanding that our issues are also race issues and our issues are also gendered issues. So I think it's really important for us to uplift her existence at that intersection and to remind ourselves that um, many of the folks that we idolize also have this complicated history of erasing others and to make sure that as we look around in our contemporary moment that we don't allow other people to be erased in the same way. And when we were listening to the obit. <laughs> when we were listening to the obit and they mentioned Du Bois and who's the other person they mentioned? Booker T. Washington. Yeah, like <laughs> your boy. we mouthed and they were men. Like right. it wasn't, like that, that wasn't explicitly said in right. the obit. It's like, oh, she was just 
other black le- no well those were those were black men right right it wasn't just that her uh, the way it was framed in the obituary was still um, mm-hmm. well their tactics weren't as radical as hers and so that's why it's like well you know that's which not is the only true. reason which is true but yeah I mean I, I think about like my you think about the, the role of black women in, in the conversations that are being had even today and the way that the media reports women are doing this well no not black women um, that black women are constantly a race. We're either just lumped in as black, as if we have no gender, or we're erased altogether, which was a similar struggle that she went through. Like my, my all time favorite story of hers is uh, with the suffragist march in Washington, DC, where they want uh, black women to be supporting their larger movement uh, for voting rights. But then when they get to the march, because they're afraid of white Southern women want a segregated march, they tell her that they have to march in the back. So she stands on the sideline and disappears. And then when the march starts, she pushes her way to the front of the march. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I love that story, but it also speaks to the struggle. I I, I was just speaking about Ida B. Wells the other day. I started an investigative news training organization named after Ida B. Wells. And I was speaking about it, and, and we always get this question, like, why, why do you think people don't know about her? And I was like, because she is a black woman. Black women are always erased. We don't, when we think about the NAACP and its anti-lynching campaign, she is the reason the NAACP right. had an anti-lynching campaign, and she gets completely written well, out why, of that history. Well, that's why the NAACP was, was started. Right. But she... <laughs> Right. You don't hear her at all, and she is the reason that the organization exists and that we even knew that there was an anti-lynching campaign. And so you see that just again and again, and I think you still see black women struggling to be heard. When black women are advocating, they are advocating for everyone, mm-hmm. right? We are the perfectors of this democracy, and yet we are never getting the credit for that work, and it just goes all the way back, in it, and, it, and you still see that now. Eve, can you talk um, a bit about what Chicago was like when she moved here? Yeah, so it's really interesting. This was a, a very tumultuous time to be to be living in Chicago, um, and it's a, a history, a part of the city that many people don't know. So, of course, 1919 was known as the Red Summer um, because there were these race riots all across the country, and the one that happened in Chicago was the largest. Um, and the time in the the wake of that. Uh, really left the city um, thinking about how could we prevent something like that from happening again. There was a a, a commission of uh, black and white civic leaders who came together, uh, all men, uh, you know, civically serious leaders uh, who came together (laughs) to... um, figure out a way to kind of why did this riot happen and what could be happening to what could happen to prevent it um and it was also a time when many of the racial patterns of segregation that we see now Mm -hmm. were really being cemented in as a as an aftermath in the fear of that kind of racial violence and so i think it's really um telling and of course the the riot in 1919 happened because uh, a teenage boy eugene williamson um was killed in lake michigan um which, you know, we could, the reason he, he drowned as a result of a, a group of uh, white residents who were on the beach throwing rocks um, so that he was afraid to come back onto the shore and he, he drowned, uh, which, you know, we could also consider a form of lynching. And then there were a number of, of lynchings that happened um, during the riot. And so I think it's uh, almost uh, a form of foreshadowing that this, this anti-lynching crusader who had uh, so much belief in um, the role of fighting anti-black violence uh, came to the city during this seminal time when there was a lot of anti-black violence, including uh, a a campaign of bombings that was happening um, to any black people trying to move outside of Bronzeville, as well as real estate agents or bankers trying to help black people move outside of Bronzeville. Um, For a four year period between 1917 and 1921, there were 58 bombings that occurred, um, which averages out to one bombing um, every 20 days for three years and eight months. So you can imagine during the time that she's living here, um, imagine if every three weeks somebody's home is being bombed, right, for almost four years. So it was a very violent, very tumultuous time in our history. And so fast forward, uh, a few decades, if even that. Um, Robert Taylor is the first black chair of the Chicago Housing Authority. Mm-hmm. He's also Valerie Jarrett's grandfather. I did not know that. Yeah. 
little known fact. Chicago is too small. That's yeah. a tough. <laughs> <laughs> I thought the audience would be like, duh, yeah. everybody knows that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, and he traveled around Europe to look at the best models of, of public housing. And I know that his family did not like what the high rises look like. Um, but he was very proud of the Ida B. Wells mm -hmm. development and the gardening and having public space and, and community. Um, we'll talk more about the ghost of that. Right. But because uh, it, it no longer um, exists as Ida B. Wells. Michelle, what did the family think of that <coughs> development with her name on it? Well, I think at the time when it was built in 1941, um, it was considered a great honor because it was um, like innovative at the time and, and a, a really big step up from where a lot of people were living, um, the, the conditions that they were living in in Bronzeville. It was, and also the thing that made it even more of an honor was the fact that it was named after Ida B. Wells because of community. Um, asking for that, to like pushing for that. So th when you have a community of people that are, you know, advocating for somebody who lived in the neighborhood, then it's not just coming from the family, it's coming from outside of the family. So that was a really big honor. And I remember growing up being, having my parents drive me past the, the homes and saying, oh, this is named after your great grandmother. And you know, just like um, the little girl who was here earlier, it's like, okay, whatever, you know. Um, you know, you're just not impressed when you're six. Um, <laughs> Eve's niece. It's my niece. She's, she does. Yeah. She's unimpressed. Um, you're just not, you know. Remember when you're six years old. But as I've grown um, and I realize that's really not a small thing to have an entire community named after your ancestor. But as the, the homes changed um, to become almost synonymous in this city with every dereliction you can think of, I mean, it was, it was just kind of, that's how it was perceived. So it, it became sort of a double-edged sword for us because on the one hand, you know, people, are, her name is still being spoken in the city, but at the same time, it's being associated with almost exactly the opposite of what she stood for. Um, so when the homes came down, we all had mixed feelings because we're like, okay, now we can start from scratch and help people remember who Ida, the woman, was, and not Ida, the homes mm -hmm. were. Um, so, I mean, it's just unfortunate that, that the homes became uh, associated with so much negativity. And, I, and I, we all realized that there are many residents who lived in the homes who did not fit the, the negative kind of um, constant drum <laughs> that we would hear in the news. But unfortunately, that's what it became in the public space, um, in the public memory. So, you know. I don't know what else to say, but yeah, yeah. that was it. <laughs> and, and so, it, you know, you're, we're talking about black women not being erased, making sure that they are known, that you have this development that's a symbolism and it's gone and there's a moment to reset, at least within the city, and say who she is. And now here we are where there is this campaign for, that's been going on for a long time, but um, to build a, a statue memorial, but has picked up some more traction and a street naming after her. Um, why do you think this has been the, the moment, you know, besides Nicole's Twitter feed, um, <laughs> oh my you God. know, helping, helping raise Talk money? About <laughs> She's my hero. <laughs> oh my God. Nicole heard about the project and she just went on fire um, to help make this possible. So she deserves all the credit in the world for, for um, helping really helping a lot to, to get the um, project funded. But um, as far as why, I th this is my personal opinion, is um, I think it's a combination of the sort of demonization that's going on of the media, mm. considering that she was a journalist who operated in very violent um, time. I think some people in the field are revisiting how she operated and how she documented facts in a hostile environment and used those facts to challenge a system. Um, I think the Me Too movement has helped bring up some of the work that she was doing and people are tying 
what's going on today with what was going on when she was around. Um, and I also think that the state sanctioned violence that's going on in our country right now with all of these shootings um, where by police officers of unarmed people and they are not being prosecuted. Most of them are not. Um, so I think those three things are converging to help people want to re-examine how did she do what she did? What was she doing? And how did she stand up to the institutions and the um, sort of powers that be and use journalism as a weapon to fight? What's the, can you give us an update on the memorial? Um, well, thanks to Nicole's <laughs> um, never ending um, support, we, uh, she and uh, Mariam Kaba and I, the three of us were like machines. Um, and we spent about four months like aggressively working Twitter to encourage people to support the project. And so from April 8th, um, when I first sent out my first tweet, until July 16th, um, which is Ida's birthday, between the three of us, we raised $200,000 on Twitter. <laughs> And um, so, so the monument is funded. It, we, the, the total budget was three hundred thousand. So, two hundred thousand dollars raised in four months versus seven years of raising a hundred thousand before that. So it was it was just an amazing experience for me to see how this could work. I mean, it really showed me that that Ida has a national appeal and even international. Um, and so that was very heartwarming for me to see the level of enthusiasm that people had. I mean, some of the comments that we were receiving was yeah, amazing. Yeah, it was amazing. We were um, like up all night that night. I know. <laughs> I think it was like a 15-hour day yeah. we were on Twitter. Um, so, I mean, we, we raised um, $42,000 on her birthday mm -hmm. on July 16th on one day. So are yeah. you at the 300000 or you have another 100000 to go? No, we no. had 100000 at the beginning yeah, okay. of 2018. So from April 8th, 2018, until July 16th, we raised the other 200. And is there a location? Have yes, it will be located on 37th and Langley in a plaza area, which is almost in the middle of where the Ida B. Wells homes used mm -hmm. to be. Um, Richard Hunt, who is a world-renowned sculptor, is going to do the monument. Wow. It is a monument not a lifelike statue. Okay. It'll be um, abstract and interpretive, but it will include some images of her, um, some quotes and some biographical information. Um, so Richard Hunt is ready to go. He's all enthusiastic about it. And so basically from this point forward, it's up to Richard on when this will actually be completed. I mean, my hope, and I think all of our hopes is that it will be 2019, um, but we'll see, you know, artist, how that how it might go. You know? <laughs> Can, can I add something yeah, about yeah. the moment? I, I also think that all of the conversations about Confederate monuments and yes. their removal and who are we memorializing and who are we not memorializing also really oh, helped yeah. drive support for having uh, this monument to a black woman when there are almost no monuments anywhere in the country to black people and certainly not to black women. So I think a lot of those conversations oh, yeah. and us just thinking about you know, who we memorial says, memorialize says everything about who we think we are. That's right. And the story of America that we want to tell. And um, when we did our Twitter campaign, it was also when people were tearing these statues down, when people were having conversations about these statues. And I think that that also really helped drive enthusiasm that we need to tell a counter narrative, uh, a more truer narrative about who this country is and has been. Yeah, that's true. I think we're ready for questions now. We have a first one down there. Okay. Could uh, we get the house lights up? Thank you. Um, so we're gonna circulate a couple of mics around on either side. If you have a question, please raise your hand. Oh, our first one is up here. Hallie, could you grab her? Thank you. We have a question in the middle of the house. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> um, I was wondering how does Ida B. Wells influence you and your work today, and how do you see her in yourself? Um, you know, I guess that's for all of you, you want to know from all of us? 
<laughs> okay, great. Uh, you know, this is a really uh, scary time. Um, certainly to be a journalist, to be a writer, to be a truth teller. Um, as, as long as there have been courageous people, there have been people dedicated to keeping them quiet because people like Ida B. Wells um, revealed the truth of how truly violent and horrible and horrifying much of our history is. And part of the reason these monuments are so important is, as Nicole said, to redefine our understanding of American history. And that is threatening to many people. Um, and as a result, the kind of, of backlash um, is really real. And I think for me personally, uh, thinking about Ida B. Wells and, and the way that she put herself in literal physical mm -hmm. danger. She put her body on the line to tell stories. And remember, there's no internet in 1919, mm -hmm. right? And so the, there's no television, none of that. And so uh, she put her life on the line to firsthand gather the true stories of how black people were murdered in cold blood and uh, was willing to, to take a lot of risks to do that. And so I think in moments when I feel afraid or uncertain about the consequences of, of my own work or my own choices, I take a lot of courage from that. Um, I mean, I could talk for like 45 minutes, but I won't. <laughs> I promise I won't. Um, I mean, one, just in terms of a, a, journalism, a journalist and craft, right? her interviewing techniques, her uh, data collection techniques. I think like she really was uh, an innovator in that way. So that legacy is very uh, important to me. But also, um, I feel like the work that I do is very hopeless overall, that I'm documenting um, which, what, that which is foundational to our country, so that which I think we will never rid ourselves of. Mm -hmm. And uh, mostly these days my work is on school segregation. I spend my time uh, in classrooms that um, you could not say were functioning as schools at all. And where both children and teachers describe them uh, as holding cells and sometimes even I had a teacher say this is a concentration camp. Mm. Um, so I know that we are never gonna do the right thing for black children, but I still have to do the work that I'm doing. And, and I think about Ida B. Wells and her anti-lynching campaign. She never got that anti-lynching legislation that she was seeking, but she still had to document, even if you don't think that your work is going to change the lives of the people who you're fighting for, you still have to document because I think she understood and I understand that what we would rather do is just ignore and pretend mm -hmm. that we're not doing to people what we're doing to them. And um, you know what she said is the, the way to right wrongs is to shine the light of truth upon them. And I think about that literally almost every single day. It's like on the bottom of my website, like I think about it all the time. Um, and then I also think about she was going to tell the truth. And when it hurt her, she was going to tell the truth. And there are a lot of times in my career um, where I got in trouble for being outspoken, where I got called into meetings um, and told you're writing about race too much. If you want to have a successful career, I get all, all the, uh, yeah. All of that. These days I have a lot of gloating, let's just say that. Everyone, <laughs> everyone who told me I need to stop writing about race is like eating mad crow right now, but. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but you think about everyone who told her she needed to stop speaking so bluntly and plainly, she needed to stop advocating, and she did not. And that's part of the reason why we didn't know about her because in the end, her unwillingness to compromise is what led her to be erased. Um, so I think about that a lot and if she had the courage to do it, then I have to have that same courage. Where's our I've mic? Got one right down oh. here. Uh, in doing research for a musical about the 1893 World's Fair, I found oh. out a lot about Ida B. Wells. <laughs> and uh, I included her as one of the strongest characters in, in the musical. Uh, she, I'm just wondering about, uh, because knowing that she tried to convince the fair committee to include blacks in the Black planning. People 
Excuse me? Black people. Black people, thank you. Include black people in the planning and the construction of the fair. And she really didn't succeed in that. Uh, and she, we read her writings and she sings a very powerful song about the sweet land of liberty, not the land that I see. I'm wondering how she kept her hope along with the, her anger. And, and, and if you want to say something about how, how do you sustain hope when you feel such rage for a cause? Do you want to answer that? Um, <laughs> Well, your question is, uh, I, th I think there only w one can only uh, assume. Um, I mean, she was a woman of faith. She, you, you, if you read her uh, diary, you really get the sense that she was very uh, religiously grounded. Um, and I think that gave her a sense of hope and a sense of strength. Um, I think that whenever somebody decides to stand up for something, the only way they would be able to do it is to have some sense of hope that it is possible for something to change. Otherwise, what's the point of, of even trying? So, I mean, what we, what we always grew up understanding was that she had a hope that there was some sense of decency somewhere in the hearts of people in this country and overseas. She believed that on some level, there would be some sense of justice. And once people knew the truth about what was going on, then there would be some sense, sense of outrage that there would be a sen a, 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 an effort to stop absolute just anarchy and barbarity. Um, and so when she was writing, she wasn't writing for the people who knew what was going on. She was writing for the people who did not know what was going on so that they would feel that this is not our country. This is not who we are. What kind of country is this? And so she had to have a sense of hope that people would have a reaction to that and put a stop to it. I don't have hope, so. <laughs> <laughs> we have a question down here. We have a question up front. You guys give us hope to see women such as yourselves in a venue like this. That gives us hope. As long as there's life, there's hope. But to come back to um, my key question, there had been uh, an Ida B. Wells Barnett chair, I think, at DePaul. Mm -hmm. And I know that uh, Michael Eric Dyson held it, Laura Washington held it. Whatever, is it still going on? And, and how can we help with those kinds of initiatives so that journalists who are coming up can learn? I mean, as far as I know, it is still going on. The last person that I knew, I, I can't remember the guy's name, but the, the, the last person that I was aware of um, holding that chair was um, British. Um, and I actually, uh, I tracked him down and, and um, actually met with him in person. Um, but that was a couple of years ago. I haven't, I haven't kept up since then, but he was a very um, impressive person. Um, and, but yeah, it was interesting, he, he was British. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, he, he was Afro-British, if you wanna call it mm. that, you know. <laughs> <laughs> All right, okay. Decent. Important caveat. <laughs> There's a question. Great, yep, question. we have one more, uh, time for one more question. We're gonna go right down here. Hi, um, I'm a recent, uh, there's a young person dressed as a box of popcorn. I just, <laughs> I'm gonna shout out. We can't hear your question, sis, but we see you and appreciate you. <laughs> um, I'm a recent college grad, hopefully becoming a writer in the future, um, but I help run a program that, um, empowers, works to empower young women um, in uh, writing, citizen journalism, and um, digital media storytelling. And I think um, what we struggle with a lot of the time is 
having them believe that their voices are important and their voices are worth sharing. And um, you guys just being yourselves in, in the professions that you have are definitely inspiration. But if we could hear for them, they're here, some of them are here with us right now. Um, if you could share some words of empowerment or maybe a moment where you realize that you could use, use your voice to make change, um, that would be really helpful to people, all women of color and young high school women of color from Chicago. Um, you know, any words of encouragement? Well, I'll start, because I, I didn't answer the other question about what do I see in myself, um, or how, what do I see about Ida and myself. I mean, obviously, I'm related to her, so people tell <laughs> me that I look like her. Um, but one of the things that I feel was passed down in my family that I feel is a part of who Ida was is um, the feeling that my voice is important. I was always told that my entire life that you have something to say and you need to say it. You need to speak up. Um, I'm related to Ida on my father's side of the family, but my mother <laughs> was always, if anybody in the audience knows Maxine Duster, you know, that she was like, oh, no, 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 no. Who's the manager? Who's the owner? <laughs> Who's in charge? And write to that person. And my mom was always about, like, find out who's in charge. And you write to that person, and you make sure that you let them know whatever, because you are not going to allow yourself to be treated any way different than somebody else is treated. And so that was always something that we grew up hearing, knowing that we have the same rights as everybody else, and we cannot ever allow ourselves to be disrespected, um, disregarded, marginalized. You speak up and demand respect. And that's what I always learned. So we're gonna we're gonna sneak that one last question in up there. Question. Yay! <laughs> Woo! Oh, and the popcorn. <laughs> okay. Um, my name is Dorothy Jane Tillman. I'm a 12-year-old college graduate. I just got my bachelor's of science in. The choice. This is a good decision. <laughs> I just got my bachelor's of science in humanities and I started my master's program in environmental engineering last Monday. And I wanted to know what you all think as a youth we could do to, uh, to keep her memory alive or keep what she did going and to, to educate people about those type of things. Vote. So. You know, I'm going to answer in a way that kind of also picks up from the previous question. I think that um, it's, always remember, it's always important to remember that the histories that are passed to us are not accidental. They come to us because the people in power and people who were in positions to uplift their own importance are the ones who for a very long time have had the privilege of telling those stories. Mm -hmm. And so there are so many people like Ida B. Wells. There are so many people like Zora Neale Hurston. There are so many people like Bayard Rustin and James Baldwin and Nina Simone and Lorraine Hansberry who have been at risk of passing into the darkness of history because they were black or because they were women or because they were gay or because they were not palatable to the people who were telling those histories. And I think it's important to remember that all of us play a role in knowing that we are the experts in our own lives. And there is nobody who can tell your story the way you can, not one person. And to the, all the young people, you are from the city of Ida B. Wells. You are from the city of Gwendolyn Brooks. You are from the city of Natalie Moore, <laughs> right? And this, this is your legacy. This is your birthright. This is your lineage. It is there for you. These are people who uplifted the importance of telling everyday people's stories. And that's something that all of us have the power to do. And I think that's how you keep this legacy alive. We have run out of time. Are there any final things you want to say to that? Or we're good? That just seemed like a great way to end it. Yeah, all right. Okay. All right. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you, Nicole. Thank you, E. Thank you, audience. Can we go back. Can we go back.